to explain to you about lower realms, we have the 31 planes of existence. You will see that there are 31 realms divided into three planes. This is explaining the different levels of existence. Some of these realms we can perceive and some we cannot. If you go to the bottom half of the page, you'll see sense sphere planes 11. These senses are operating strongly and we experience many things connected with our senses. Now this plane is subdivided into what it calls woeful planes and sensuous blissful planes. The woeful planes are places of suffering. The first one is called the, the hell realm. Um, there are various imaginative ways in which we can describe what it's like to be in a hell realm. Above that is the animal realm. Generally speaking, I know there are exceptions, but generally speaking, animals are experiencing a lot of problems, a lot of suffering. Everybody eats each other, struggle to get food, struggle to survive. It's not a happy place. Peta, peta means a hungry ghost. These are beings who are portrayed with images of huge bellies and a very, very, very thin throat. So they cannot take on the amount of food and drink they need to satisfy their hunger. Above that are Asuras. We don't really have an English word for Asura. Sometimes translated as a Titan. A being that is actually full of jealousy for the beings living in the higher planes. Then we have the human plane. And above that, we have six, what are generally called heavenly planes, heavenly realms, where beings are enjoying a pleasant or happy existence. If somebody asks, are there gods in Buddhism? We would say yes. Planes 6 to 11 are what we call gods. But two things are important. The first is that these gods are not eternal. Secondly, they are unable to influence the lives of other beings. In some religions there is a supreme deity, a supreme god, who is seen as able to um, influence the lives of others. That is not the case in Buddhism. You will see on the right hand side there's an increasing lifespan. Well, the, bo the bottom five just says indefinite. But above that, you can see a number of celestial years that these beings can live. Above that, 
we have the fine material sphere plane, the 16 of them. These are attained by beings who are experienced, skilled meditators. And by practicing a certain form of meditation, they can attain states we call jhana. I mentioned jhana last week. In Sanskrit is dhyana, and then Chan Buddhism in China, and Zen Buddhism in Japan. And beings born in these, well, first of all, these planes can be attained, even in the human realm, temporarily, by attaining states of jhana during meditation. But if you are a skilled meditator, and a habitual, um, habitually you are able to attain these planes, then at uh, death you may be reborn in one of these higher planes. And above that, there are four immaterial planes. That is because there is no longer any physical body. It's just mind. And these are very, very refined states of mind. Last week I mentioned the, the Prince Siddhartha had two teachers, Alarika Lama and Uddhika Ramaputta. Alarika Lama, he taught the attainment of number 30, nothingness. And Uddhika Ramaputta, he taught number 31, neither perception nor non-perception. So these planes are not unique to Buddhism, and they can be attained by anyone who is sufficiently diligent and skillful in practicing a form of meditation we call Samatha meditation or calming meditation. Here now the, the lifespan has increased into eons. To give you an idea of what is an eon, think of a block of rock. One mile wide, one mile long, one mile high. Once in a hundred years, a man comes with a silk handkerchief, just touches the rock. That rock will be worn away before an eon has come to an end. So it's a long time. Now the point about all of these different realms is that none of them is permanent. Sooner or later, life in that particular realm comes to an end. And then there is the process of rebirth. And the rebirth will be governed by our actions. The word kamma. If we have performed wholesome actions, they will have wholesome effects. If we have performed unwholesome actions, they will have unwholesome effects. So regardless of how you've been living in these planes, when your life is up in one of those planes, rebirth follows, and it may not be in another happy plane. It depends upon whatever karma ripens at the moment of death. So if you've had some unskillful action stored up for several lifetimes, that 
could condition a life in one of the woeful planes. The problem with the life in these woeful planes is that it's very, very difficult to get out of them because you need to perform good karma, wholesome karma. How are you going to do that when you're suffering miserably? The Buddha said that the human plane is the most important plane. Because in the human plane, we can hear the Buddha's teachings and we can practice them, we can develop our minds according to his principles, and we, from that development, can attain Nibbana, enlightenment. The trouble with these higher planes is that they're so enjoyable, people are just sitting around doing nothing all day but um, drinking ambrosia and watching television. They're, they've got, they're not actually doing much with their lives, they're just enjoying them. So the human plane is very important. Human plane is a mixture of both happiness and unhappiness. So we have the carrot and we have the stick. The carrot is happiness. We can experience happiness and we like it and so we want more of it. So we have an incentive to try to live a good life. The stick is that we also experience unhappiness and we don't like it. So that prompts us also to try to live a good life rather than do unskillful things. So when I said the word Dhamma supports us, it is a support that prevents us from falling down into the woeful planes. So the Buddha's teaching helps us to live a good life and a happier life. These things are very relative. If you think of an insect that lives maybe for a day, and you would say to that insect, you know, there are beings that live for 70, 80, 100 years. The insect's going to say, come off it. Don't believe it. A hundred years? You're pulling my leg. So, we see things in terms of our human perception. But, maybe there are other things going on. I know that we cannot detect all of these planes. We can detect the human plane. We can detect the animal plane. Sometimes people say they've seen a ghost. But if you think of it like um, the radio, your radio may be tuned in to receive radio one. It can't at the same time receive radio two, three, and four, or five. So it doesn't mean to say those are not also there, but it's just you're not tuned into them. So maybe we're not tuned in to receiving these higher realms. So I agree, we cannot prove their existence objectively. They can be proved, if you wish to, by practicing and perfecting the techniques of meditation I mentioned. Life in these realms is all considered to be part of, the word is samsara. Samsara is the endless round of birth, death, another birth, another death, another birth, another death, going on and on and on. Sometimes 
The birth may be in a happy state, sometimes the birth may be in an unhappy state. But this just this this cycle of life continues indefinitely. The Buddha said, inconceivable is the beginning of this samsara. Not to be discovered is a first beginning of beings who, obstructed by ignorance and ensnared by craving, are hurrying and hastening through this round of rebirths. Which do you think is more? The flood of tears which, weeping and wailing, you have shed upon this long way, hurrying and hastening through this round of rebirths, united with the undesired, separated from the desired, this or the waters of the four great oceans. Long have you suffered the death of father and mother, of sons, daughters, brothers and sisters, and whilst you were thus suffering, you have indeed shed more tears upon this long way than there is water in the four great oceans. So, he said, inconceivable is the beginning. Sometimes people ask, what did the Buddha say about the beginning of the world, the beginning of life? He didn't say anything very much. He just said, even he could not see back to the beginning of this process. He was much more concerned with where we are at the moment and getting ourselves extricated from our present problems, not worrying about where we all came from in the first place. So, samsara is regarded as, an, generally speaking, an unhappy existence in that there is no permanent happiness to be found. There is temporary happiness, certainly. Even as human beings, we experience temporary happiness. But we don't experience permanent happiness. The good times come to an end, sooner or later. And for the Buddha, that was very unsatisfactory. He wanted permanent happiness, lasting happiness. Not something which would come and go and come and go. So by attaining the state of enlightenment, you step off these, this chart completely. The state of Nibbana is not shown here. Nibbana means permanent happiness. It's not subject to these rounds of birth again and again and again. Straight after his enlightenment, the Buddha said, This is my last birth. There is no more coming to be. And he was happy about that, because he saw birth as the prelude, inevitably, to various forms of suffering and unhappiness. So, we, <laughs> from the Buddhist point of view, we shouldn't really get happy at, at the birth of somebody, because we know that being is going to experience, sooner or later, to a lesser or greater extent, forms of unhappiness. But if we can step out of this whole cycle and attain the state of Nibbana, then that is permanent happiness. 